Okay, let's get started. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce today's keynote presenter, Donna Walker Kuhn. I first met Donna more than 15 years ago as a presenter at a conference on building the next generation of arts audiences. I've heard her speak many times. Her book, Invitation to the Party, continues to inspire my thinking about inclusivity and bridge building in the community. Donna is an award-winning thought leader, writer, and strategist for community engagement, audience development, and social justice. She is president of Walker International Communications Group and a senior advisor in community engagement for the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. She's a veteran of over 22 Broadway productions, and her nonprofit clients include the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater, New York State Council on the Arts, and the Seattle Theater Group. She is set to release her second book, Champions for the Arts, Lessons and Successful Strategies for Engaging Diverse Audiences, very soon. Hopefully she'll give us a little bit of more information on that. Donna is joining us virtually today, and I know you will be inspired by her phenomenal energy and insight. Please help me welcome Donna Walker Kuhn. Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much, David, for a wonderful introduction. I am so happy uh, to be able to speak with you <clears throat> this morning. And so I also would like to thank the Cultural Council for Palm Beach <clears throat> County for all of your tremendous efforts in putting the summit together. And thank you for that beautiful performance that opened up the conference, but also to open up our hearts. I'd like to begin with the land acknowledgement. So I am here in Brooklyn, New York. So we're gathered on the unceded land of the Lenape people. And I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lenape community, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. We must also acknowledge that the grounds where we stand were for founded upon exclusions and erasures of the voices of many indigenous and oppressed people. I acknowledge that the teaching of the United States history in the schools, cultural institutions, and the media have left out many voices and difficult truths in order to create an idealized nationalistic identity. I acknowledge the struggles of oppressed people, both actively and justice for all. I believe the land acknowledgments are extremely important. And so uh, thank you for allowing me to share that with you. So I am a fourth generation post-slavery daughter my parents were part of the Great Migration from the South to the North. My family is from Florida. I am very comfortable throughout Florida and happy that I am able to speak with you, uh, those of you who are there in Florida as well today. My pronouns are she, her, and I began my career as a dancer and then I went to law school because I wanted to have a consistent paycheck. I but also wanted to change the world. And so I've built my career um, for the past 40 years on audience development and community engagement. I'm currently involved, um, focused on social justice initiatives and diversity, equity, and inclusion training for arts organizations. But it's no coincidence that I'm here with you today. Everything I've done as an arts administrator has led me to this journey of building a culture of DEI in the arts sector. You know, starting from teaching myself the basics of arts administrator while practicing law, prosecuting juvenile. I volunteered at an arts organization on my lunch hour and taught myself the basics of press and fundraising and, and marketing. And then working uh, with the Dance Theater of Harlem as a director of marketing and they're really developing audience development strategies to engage African American audiences, uh, followed by my tenure at the public theater working with George C. Wolf, when my job description was to create an audience that looks like a subway stop. And so throughout all of this time, I've just continued to build and fill in the gaps of what's been missing. At New Jersey Performing Arts Center in 2014, I was the vice president of marketing there and I realized that there were some gaps. I noticed that the people of color were not necessarily coming inside the building, they were passing the building. So I started to look into that and wanted to think about what's missing, why aren't they coming inside? And that's when I started to focus on community engagement, that there is a need for us to take the arts to where the people live and on their terms. And so we created a community engagement department, uh, one of the first in the country, led by a vice president with a dedicated budget and staff. And from that, we were able to develop numerous programs that have continued to blossom and grow today. 
After the murder of George Floyd, I felt that every arts organization needed to build in social justice as part of how you do business. And so I developed a program called Standing in Solidarity New Jersey Performing Arts Center, which is a monthly uh, film and panel discussion on key issues in the various communities, along with action steps uh, that lead to transformation. So I believe that our past, our history, our legacy dictate our sincerity and intentionality in doing this work. And I've had three life-changing moments in the arts that have shaped my values, my beliefs, and my strategies. The first was in South Africa with the Dance Theater of Harlem uh, in uh, that 2002. It was right after the release of President Nelson Mandela. And I had been invited there to uh, as part of the dance company was invited to perform to integrate the civic theater. And as the director of marketing, I went in advance to build a campaign. While we were meeting there, um, the, the presenters took me for a tour of the civic theater. And as we walked inside, the workmen were still finishing up some of the repairs and they put their tools down and they stood up. And, and I said, what are they doing? Why are they standing up? And my tour guide said, oh, they're honoring you. You are the first black person to walk across this stage as a free person, someone that's not working or an indentured servant. I thought, wow, power of the arts, really amazing. The second moment was 9-11 when I was at the public theater. And you know, the public theater is located below 14th Street, which was an area that was cordoned off uh, during that whole 9-11 recovery. And so, you know, we, we really, talks around, should we present performances? You know, the city was in such mourning. We weren't quite sure what to do as an arts organization. And then George said, we're artists. This is what we do. And so I had uh, developed a program called Free at Three. Uh, every month we had an uh, afternoon of arts and culture. And we had planned the October Free at Three well in advance of 9-11. And it was an afternoon of poetry led by Rita, Rita Dove, who at that time was the nation's poet laureate. And so we were worried. We said, well, maybe five people will come to hear poetry. Um, we're not sure, but let's go ahead and do it. And we did. The room was filled to capacity. Almost 300 people came. And as, they, as she read her poetry, I saw them with their eyes closed. And I could see the words that she was saying literally falling off their faces, just lifting their faces up, looking for solace. It was such a powerful moment. Again, reiterated to me the importance of the arts and making it accessible to everyone. The third moment was in Moscow, where I've traveled several times working with the United Nations and teaching arts educators there and administrators about audience development. And I was working with a team of theater directors for a week. And we were going back and forth on cultural distinctions. And of course, I was using the words African American, Asian American. And one student raised his hand and he said, why do you call yourself African-American? Aren't you an American? And I thought, whoa, okay, I need to do, uh, tell them a little bit about the history of people of color in America. So I did. So I just put my notes down and started to talk to them about slavery and the impact that it had on people of color. And then I talked about, I shared a case study um, at New Jersey Performing Arts Center. We had screened the film Selma. And we had done that at the request of the faith-based leadership, saying that the youth ministry had no idea on the civil rights movement. And they asked, would you please screen this film and have a panel discussion? So we did. And, you know, the youth really enjoyed it. We had 700 young people, and it was just great. And so the next day in Moscow, um, I walk into the room, and the students looked very somber. And I thought, what happened? So I said, what happened? And they said, we went back to our rooms and we watched the documentary Selma. Next time, start with Selma. So I learned a really important point, not to assume that everyone understands the history and the impact of race in America and that it has a very powerful effect on what people think and feel. So I share these with you so that you understand why I'm here with you today at the summit. Uh, and, you know, kind of the ethos in which I develop my work. So why are we all here today? Well, I think this is an amazing transformational time for the arts through the lens of equity, diversity, and inclusion. 
And we're here you know, to really discuss that and to explore that. So I have a few slides I'd like to share with you. So let's begin. And so um, the first slide, let's see, I can't see that. There we go, that's me. The first slide I want to talk about, um, we can go advance, please. So I love philosophy and I love to frame the work in a foundational context. So it's not just knee-jerk, it's not just responsive, but it's actually rooted in a philosophical um, way of thinking. And so I'm going to share a few thoughts from some of the people that really influenced me. One of them is Daisaku Ikeda, he's a Japanese philosopher, and he talks about how this is the time for us to become pioneers of a better age. He says, there's no other solution to the problem of racial discrimination than realizing the human revolution of each individual. In other words, an inner reformation in the depths of people's lives to transform the egoism that justifies the subjugation of others and replace it with the humanism that strives for coexistence among all people. This is so important to me because it focuses on each person taking responsibility to be the one to make the change. So this is no finger pointing, like you should do this. You have to look at your unconscious bias. Everything is me-centered. What am I doing? And that's why I so appreciate this summit because of hearing the accomplishments um, that have been made already clearly indicates, you know, that this is something that is taken very seriously and that there's accountability. The next slide, please. So when the, the pandemic first began last year, one of my favorite writers, Arunanti Roy, she shared this quote in an interview, and I believe it applies to the three pandemics that we experienced over these past 15 months, of course, starting with COVID-19 um, and then the insurrection over the murder of George Floyd and then the insurrection at the Capitol. And so, and the political discord that we've all experienced uh, during this time. And so I think this quote is also an opportunity for us to reflect on how do we move forward. She says, historically, Pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It's a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. So I believe that's the juncture that we're at right now. We're ready to fight for it. And we don't have to bring all of the baggage from before, especially what was not working. And then the third um, quote that I want to share, that it's the heart that matters. Next slide, please. You know, when we think about where does this work come from, I believe it's heart-centered work to care about how I engage with other people, to look at what does respect mean? How do I bring dignity to the workplace? It's the heart that matters. That's how we care to rights. When you transform your heart, your everyday actions will undergo a change and you can even transform your environment. The creation of an ideal world begins with the metamorphosis of a single individual. Back to my key point that each person is responsible for changing the destiny of the, the community and the environment. Next slide. So there's some key voices in the field, arts administration, that have really been sharing with us the impacts of uh, diversity, equity, inclusion. I wanted to just share a few of those thoughts with you. One is from Sandra Jackson Dumont, who is now the president of the Lucas Museum. Formerly, she was at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And one of the points she makes that I really appreciate, she says there's no end date for diversity, bio, bias awareness and inclusion work. If an organization is to ensure equitable access and opportunities for everyone, the work should be a part of the DNA of the entire organization. And so as was stated earlier, you know, this is not a, a temporary fix. This is not the flavor of the month. This is now how we're going to do business forever. As, as a colleague of mine calls it, forever endeavor. Another uh, voice in this field that I like to, to share is from Dr. Indira Eparo, who's the director of the Apple Theater. Uh, formerly, she was the director of the Billie Holiday Theater in Brooklyn. And she talks about how important it is that we create brave spaces. And so we talk about, okay, we're gonna have this training. 
we're going to have these workshops. But do your staff, do, do the employees, do the artists feel that they're in a safe space to be able to express what has happened to them or what they're feeling, what they're, you know, how they want to be engaged? So Dr. Tuolo says that you know, it's really important to empower staff internally so that the culture becomes one where you can speak freely without fear of repercussions. I hear that all the time. You know, staff will say, but I don't want to say anything because I don't want to lose my job. So we have to eradicate that, that condition and that belief. Uh, Dr. Tuono says creating brave spaces leads to creating change. And then the third voice um, that is so critical right now is Darren Walker, president of the Ford Foundation, who, as you know, has completely redirected, redirected his funding uh, to, to recognize, as he called them, marginalized cultural organizations. And this is significant because he manages a $14 billion portfolio. And Darren Walker talks about diversity. And he says, diversity for me is about excellence. And he says, regrettably, you know, diversity has been framed by some people that it's a loss of equality or a loss of quality. But actually, Darren Walker says, the research shows that diversity makes organization better. And so he says, I don't talk about diversity without talking about excellence. And I love that, that the idea of diversity and excellence in the same sentence. So there's really three key points that I want to share with you this morning, you know, how to get started, um, the language of diversity, equity, inclusion, and, you know, action steps that we can take. And we'll be exploring those even more deeply when we get into the uh, breakout sessions later on. So um, next slide, please. So how to get started. Um, diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility. Um, as I mentioned, many people uh, ask, you know, how do you get started? How do I lead DEI and our organization? So leadership is critical and it's critical to own this 100%. So what does that mean? Self-education. That is key along with providing learning opportunities for the staff. And so when you think about leadership, you want to articulate the vision. You want to surround yourself with people who can translate the vision build participation by creating accessibility and diversity so you have many voices around the table so happy to hear you have an equity committee that's excellent value your team so many people say i don't feel valued i come to work i bring my heart i work hard but i don't feel valued so we have to really be conscious of that and then to build bridges to the various constituents that you serve consistently so internal and external so at New Jersey Performing Arts Center, I'm the advisor for, senior advisor for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And as we started to talk about how do we implement this, you know, working very closely with our vice president of human resources, you know, we did surveys and asked the staff what are some of the key issues. One of the areas that we realized that we do well is diversity. You know, we're based in Newark, New Jersey, which is almost 80% African-American. Um, so we have, you know, a robust, participation of multicultural artists and staff. But what we were lacking in was the equity and inclusion component. And so that's what we decided to focus on. So when you're starting to build this, you want to look at what bubbles up to the top. You know, we can't do everything at one time. And you want to realize again, and I'll keep reiterating this, it's a long-term initiative. So where do you start? I think it's where you have the most, um, you know, the most activity and the deepest concern. And so we focus on equity and inclusion. And, and why is that? Well, inclusion, you know, is so important because it builds a culture of belonging by act actively inviting the contribution and participation of all people. And so inclusion means everyone is invited to the table. So when you're having a meeting and you're making decisions, you want to look around that table and see who's missing, who's not here that we're discussing, who's not here that we're making decisions about. That's how you can start to, to really change what inclusion feels like. Because inclusion means everyone's voice adds value. And we want to create a balance in the face of the power differences. Because no one person should be called upon to represent everyone, which is why you need to have as many different kinds of voices possible so that the decisions are based on inclusivity. 
and that you can build this culture of belonging by actively inviting, you know, um, these various uh, demographics and participants. It's also where people's differences are valued. So it's not trying to get everyone to look the same, sound the same, speak the same. But in fact, we welcome diverse opinions and ideas so that everyone can thrive. Equity seeks to ensure fair treatment and equality of opportunity and fairness and access to information and resources. And so you may say, oh, well, everyone here can grow. Everyone has the opportunity to excel. But do they? Do they have the tools? Do they have the resources? Do they need training? Do they need a mentor, a coach? How do we make sure that everyone has what they need to successfully thrive? And that's what equity kind of you know, advances. And this is really only possible in an environment that's built on respect and dignity. Accessibility supports an environment that provides individuals with disabilities an opportunity to participate in various events, programs, benefits, and services that are equal to their peers with who do not have disabilities. And this became very clear to me as some of our staff started to talk about not all disabilities are visible. And so, you know, some of us have really difficult times just being able to organize our thoughts or being able to look at, sit at screen all day. And so many different ways that we want to look at how do we make sure that accessibility is being addressed from different vantage points. And so these are the areas that we decided to focus on. Um, there's also um, key areas. Um, next slide, please. Uh, that I believe are the foundation of DEI training, um, and that is microaggressions, unconscious bias, you know, anti-racist uh, behavior, uh, thinking, uh, then the language of uh, how we describe uh, different cultures. And so microaggressions, you know, I know we hear a lot about that. These are really important. You know, microaggressions are these daily insults, indignities that are perpetrated against marginalized people because of their affiliation uh, with various groups. And racial microaggressions are really insults and indignities perpetrated against people of color. And the cumulative effect of this is that it does psychological damage. You know, when you're going into a workspace, or you're going into a venue where you already feel you're going to be judged because of what you look like. Someone's going to question you about maybe what you're wearing um, or, you know, are you going to take something? All of that starts to build. And how do I feel comfortable? How do I feel welcome? And so it leads to anxiety disorders and depression. So microaggressions are real. They happen daily, particularly to people of color. Unconscious bias. Um, so we all are... Uh, guilty of unconscious bias. That is not just relegated to race. That's the, that is social stereotypes about uh, certain groups of people that individuals form opinions about, you know, and so unconscious bias is really prevalent, much more so than conscious prejudice, because conscious prejudice means I'm intentionally deciding that you're someone that I think is beneath me or is not equal to who I am. Unconscious bias is I wasn't even aware I was thinking that way. So let's just look at a couple of examples. You know, what do you think examples of unconscious bias? Have a different accent. Hmm, does that affect their ability to do the work? A single mom. Hmm, will that affect their ability to be on time or to stay late? Older person, they may have limitations, maybe can't keep up have lighter or darker skin. You know, colorism is a huge topic. I'm producing a panel on color colorism in October. I cannot believe uh, the amount of research uh, that is out there that really looks at how much, wherever there's been colonization, um, those people of color aspire. You know, there is a demographic, there is a percentage of the demographic that aspires to be as light as possible uh, because it's considered to be better, to be smarter, uh, to have more access. Or this person, he is very attractive. So is that an unconscious bias? Well, he's so handsome, he's gotta be good. Or visually impaired. Um, so do we have a bias about people who maybe wear glasses, maybe thick glasses? Or has a degree from an Ivy League college? Oh, they went to Harvard. We don't even have to interview them. I'm sure they're great. All of these are unconscious bias. All of these are examples of unconscious bias. And we really want to start to be mindful of that 
um, to really think about what judgments am I making about people? Because all that contributes to this feeling of belonging, to building this culture of diversity, equity, inclusion. Anti-racist. So that's a term that has increasingly become uh, even more uh, popular after the murder of George Floyd. Um, and there's some key voices um, that have been addressing this uh, as well. And, you know, anti-racism is something that is, is important to understand because it's fighting against racism. It is not just a position of neutrality saying that I'm not racist. That's not being anti-racist. Anti-racist means I am fighting against racism. That means I'm addressing and changing the behavior that supports this unfair treatment and oppression of people of color and that racist policies become power. So if the organization doesn't look at their policies, it's very difficult to have a thriving culture. And policies have widespread impact and subtract from equity and fairness in the organization. So we have to be committed to making unbiased choices and being anti-racist. It requires a very active, engaged way of thinking intentionality. A racist idea is one that suggests that one racial group is inferior or superior to another group in any way. And racist ideas argue that these ra different racial groups are the result of, you know, their laziness or, you know, they don't try hard enough. So racist ideas have defined our society since the beginning. And sometimes it feels so natural that it's banal, you know, that there's not even a realization that I'm thinking this way, that I'm making judgments about people from different places and, what, and place who look differently. So what are some examples of anti-racist behavior? Well, dismantling the behavior, culture, and attitude of racism. And dismantling means thinking about it, talking about it, being conscious about what am I saying and doing? Where am I? Am I part of organizations that can help me to understand this more deeply? Am I members of civil rights organizations? Am I contributing to that? Where do I live? Do my children have a diverse group of, of people and friends and individuals? So examples of anti-racist behavior include where staff of color feel valued, respected, and can speak their truth. I can't tell you how many times when I work with various arts organizations, the staff of color will pull me to the side and say, I'm not really comfortable here. People here don't really respect me or listen to me. Um, you know, I have such a difficult time, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and they, they are just overwhelmed. They don't even know where to, to take that. So, you know, just because someone comes in smiling, not to assume that everything is okay. You know, we really have to do this work. And so clearly we cannot become anti-racist from the current paradigm um, that we live in. We have to change the way we think. Um, we have to examine the conditioning that makes white people apathetic about racism. You know, again, if you say, I don't see color, run. What in the world does that mean? I don't see color. That means you've chosen to ignore one, what the person looks like in front of you and denying their very existence, heritage, and legacy. And then secondly, it means that, and I'm not going to do anything about it. So that's not how we are going to build this culture of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so these are just some important points, uh, again, you know, that I'm giving you the highlights of things for you to consider as you continue your, your marvelous work. Another important concept is allyship. You know, so we talk about, okay, Here's the problem. Now, what can we do, um, you know, to really change that? And so, um, next slide, please. Keep the next slide on. I would be an ally. Yes, allyship is really important. And so, to introduce this topic, I wanted to just share the quote from uh, Congressman John Lewis. He wrote this, you know, in the, a few weeks before he passed away last year. And he said, "I want you to know that in the last days and hours of my life, you inspired me." You filled me with hope about the next chapter of the great American story when you use power to make a difference in our society. Millions of people motivated simply by human compassion laid down the burdens of, di of division. Around the country and the world, you set aside race, class, age, language, and nationality to demand respect for human dignity. And so being an ally starts again with our intention. What is it that we want to do? How can we be of support uh, and sometimes the voice? And so 
there's a number of really great writers that are, are describing what allyship can look like. One of them is Emmanuel Acho, he's a former um, NFL player and he's now an author and, and uh, speaker. And his book is, one of his books is Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. And he writes about allyship and he said, an ally is someone who makes the commitment and effort to recognize their privilege and works in solidarity with oppressed groups in the struggle for justice. An ally is a person from an empowered group who acts to help an oppressed group, even if it costs them the benefits of their power. And so this is different from being a white savior, a white person who acts to help you know, non-white people, but it's in the context of being self-serving. That's different. What he's talking about is, you know, I'm going to do whatever it takes to be able to help uproot or disrupt, you know, racism. So true allyship demands that it moves from conversation to action. So it's not just saying, oh, I'm an ally. Okay, what are you doing as an ally? And so that action might include risks, you know, for instance, we saw that here in, in New York and Brooklyn uh, during um, the spring when there was this increase in uh, violence against our Asian community. And there was an Asian couple walking down the street and they were being attacked, you know, and people were telling them, you know, you're, you're, you're the cause of COVID, you know, it was a really vicious attack. And there was a bus driver, African-American bus driver, driving his bus down the street when he saw the people being attacked, he stopped the bus and ran off and, and you know, pulled um, the perpetrator off of that couple. I mean, that person was being an ally and was certainly at a risk. He was at the risk of abandoning the bus. He could have been injured. But it's, it's really looking at what can I do with my life? You know, how can I really make a difference? Um, and so these become important. You know, in the office, how can you be an ally? Well, I think as a manager, for instance, you want to know how are your colleagues of color navigating this incredibly challenging time? And so, you know, you ask them, how are you? And not ignoring the headlines. When you see the headlines, if there's been another vicious attack, there's been more murders, there's been more injustices, check in. How are you feeling? I can only imagine. Please let me know if there's anything I can do. You know, you're not trying to solve the problem. You're demonstrating your compassion and that you're standing in solidarity. That speaks volumes when you can do something like that. And, you know, again, you may even form small groups to let them talk about how do they feel? You know, what are you feeling? You know, and you don't have to be a part of that group, but you can facilitate and make sure that it happens so there's a space where employees can talk about what they're experiencing and going through. So to be an ally is an active participation where you take risks to be different. And as Daisy um, Dominguez, another writer um, in this field, she says, there are no shortcuts or silver bullets for enabling inclusive workplaces. You can send a powerful message as an ally in a position of power and influence when you're the one who takes up the work. So you lead with your own behavior. That's the greatest source of inspiration. Um, let's look at, uh, let's see the next slide. Before we get to that, I want to talk about uh, language. So language is so important also when we're describing uh, different racial groups and ethnic groups. And I just want to briefly, you know, just do a check-in with you because uh, sometimes people use different kinds of, of language. Minority, uh, that's a, a word that should be removed from the vocabulary whenever you're describing a person of color. We're not a minority. Most importantly, most importantly, it suggests that we are less than just by using that word. And we have a minority person. Well, we all the minorities here. That means we're less than. And so it's a value statement that immediately sets the barometer that I'm better than you. And of course, that may not be the intention, but that's how it feels. And so I highly recommend that word be removed whenever you're describing people of color. Another word that has cropped up, it's been around uh, for several years, but it's increasingly become popular, it's BIPOC, Black Indigenous People of Color. And there's a lot of controversy around that word uh, because one, it's uh, what has been often said, take the time to say Black, Latinx, 
or Asian or indigenous. You know, say that as opposed to BIPOC and putting everything together. And so it, it's people thinking that all people of color are homogeneous is not true because it doesn't acknowledge the diversity and that that is what makes people, you know, feel valued and inspired. But in fact, this clumping of everyone together contributes to the dehumanization of these groups, blending them all together. It's like an erasure. It's like, oh, you all come together. And so just be mindful as you use words, who you're speaking to and what does it really mean? Um, people of color is a word that I tend to use often uh, when I'm describing many different groups of people, but I try to be intentional about acknowledging, you know, if it's African American and, and understanding these are political terms as well, Asian American, you know, well, what country is that? The same with Latinx or Latin, Latino or Hispanic. And so words are powerful and important. Take the time to understand who you're speaking with so you know what is the most appropriate way to address them. Global majority has become very popular. Um, the global majority is the word that is used to define uh, black and brown people that are from around the world. And so, you know, this phrase is something that um, I'm be becoming more and more comfortable with uh, because I think it's very powerful to highlight this, the fact that the, the world is predominantly of black and brown people. And so this global majority then includes, you know, people from Asia, Mediterranean, South Asia, East Asian, you know, Latin American countries, of course, Africa, the Caribbean, um, indigenous people. And so it's empowering when you say global majority, as opposed to minorities. Global majority, you know, it's, it's a way to unite people from all corners of the world in a very positive way. And I was reading the, you know, in the Toronto Star newspaper it said that this, this term uh, comprises, describes a group of people that comprise around 80% of the people in the world are global majority. And so understanding this truth that whiteness is not the global norm has the power to disrupt and reframe conversations on race. And so as we continue with this journey, you know, we're looking at many different aspects of how we approach the world, from our behavior, our biases, to our microaggressions, to language, how do we describe people? Can I be an ally? Am I an ally? Am I consistent? You know, all of these are all contribute to building this culture of diversity. And so um, next slide, please, um, on dialogue. I think the key uh, to everything is dialogue. Uh, that is really the way that I believe we're going to be able to advance successfully. It's not violence. I believe it is talking to people from our hearts, heart-centered work, you know, and so dialogue is the way forward, I believe, for our anti-racist work. It also underscores the interconnectedness of life, and that dialogue requires courage, which means, you know, we, we have to be bold to be able to say what it is that how we want to express ourselves, but also be bold and humble and accepting comments as if, well, that was offensive to me, or that was an inappropriate statement, and be able to accept that, apologize, and look at how can I now change my behavior. Um, and so I think dialogue is just truly, truly important. Um, also, Dialogue will challenge us to confront and transform the destructive impulses inherent in human life. So if we can think about, what am I saying? Wait a minute, let me think about this first. Be mindful. And I know by now you're thinking, this is so much work. Absolutely. But the whole point is for us to really transform the way we do business, the way that we engage our artists, so that as we look back, well, we may not be here, but as they look back on the you know, 22nd century, they'll say, wow, what a difference. There was a transformative moment, excuse me, a transformative moment there where, you know, at least in the arts community, the movement was, we're going to respect and treat each person with dignity. So that, I think, is important. And of course, there's some difficult um, discussions sometimes that we have to have. Next slide. You know, I think facilitating difficult discussions, that can be a bit uncomfortable. But 
you know, the only way to address these challenges associated with racism, sexism, and other forms of injustice in the workplace is to be open to experiencing the discomfort in an honest way. Push yourself to communicate candidly about difficult topics, apologize and admit your mistakes and blind spots, express gratitude when someone corrects you, listen to those who've been injured or silenced, and commit to doing better. I think that's a fantastic formula recipe that Daisy Dominguez uh, gives us, you know, towards these facilitating these difficult uh, conversations. Um, and so I think, you know, we look at, oh, next slide, please. You know, uh, what other action steps can we take? So we've discussed the landscape. And so it's also an opportunity to think about, okay, what can I do? How can I be a change agent? And I think, but it's a low hanging fruit. You can always look at, okay, what vendors do we work with? It's as simple as that. Who do I use for my flowers for opening night? You know, what companies am I using to deliver, you know, our catering? I remember working uh, on a project at uh, Lincoln Center. We were working on the first, uh, we we're working on an opera, uh, and it had a very large African American cast. And for opening night, they hired one of the most popular caterers in New York, Spoon Bread. And people were so excited that Spoon Bread was catering at Lincoln Center. They were buying tickets to support the catering. They didn't even know what the opera was about or frankly even cared. But it was that, that gesture of acknowledging that, okay, we have this African-American piece, we're gonna have an African-American caterer, really made a difference. Just that, the low hanging fruit. Um, sometimes we forget that. Um, I think other action steps, you know, we look at our personal and institutional preparation. I think training should be ongoing. You know, even if you're not doing the workshops, you're certainly recommending various TED Talks. You have articles, you know, you have in small groups, uh, forming equity committees, forming employee resource groups. You know, that's something that we did in NJPAC, you know, very early on. We have four employee resource groups, the ERGs, that really are vibrant and dynamic. They have contributed significantly towards the understanding of specific demographics. Our African-American ERG, they have done many presentations on the cultural and artistic contribution of African-Americans to Newark so that people can take pride in the city that we're in. Our LGBTQ um, ERG has given multiple sessions on language what does it mean, cisgender, binary, trans, pronouns? These are very important. Our women's group, very powerful. They're all about equity, being in the room, and they have brought in uh, speakers to teach on communication, on presentation, how to get a win when you're in a room with all men. Uh, and then our Latino uh, uh, ERG has talked about the distinction between people who speak Spanish and the cultural nuances of that and how that they can be uh, you know, honored and accepted. So those are some things that you can start to think about in terms of action steps uh, and institutional you know, preparation. I think everyone should take the Harvard University implicit bias test. It's free, it's online, it has multiple categories, but it's important that you understand what you feel, how you think. And the only way to do this is by having this kind of, uh, you know, objective uh, test that you can take one of those. Um, and then lastly, you know, not to depend on people of color for your racial education. I think that is so important, <coughs> not asking, well, what do you think? Or what should I read? Or what should I do? Plethora of information is available online in bookstores. So you do the work. You know, I can't tell you again how many employees of color tell me they're just tired. They're tired of being the ones that have to always explain. They're tired of, you know, they're asking me to, to present. I'm just tired. And so we have to recognize that. So you do the work for yourself. That's important. Um, and so those are just some very general kinds of um, uh, points, but I wanted to share those with you. Um, and then the next slide, again, just to uh, reiterate that this is long term. And so I know it sounds like a lot, and it is, but keep in mind a uh, long term perspective. And so we know this work never stops, and that our colleagues and partners that we have close relationships with, we want them to feel that this is positively reshaping our internal work culture. And so it's important that we first have this conviction 
so we can convey that to you know, everyone that we engage with, not just our staff internally, because this work reflects externally as well. When we started the social justice programming at, at NJPAC, we also knew we had to do the work internally. You know, you can't just go around telling people you have to change, oh, look at this terrible situation, oh, how bad this was. Well, what are we doing? And so, you know, the internal work then actually reflects externally. So if you can have both of those on track, where you're doing the DEI training and work, building your equity committees, your ERGs, your board DEI committee as well. Then if you decide to do your social justice work or deepening your engagement with multicultural uh, artists and communities, then that starts to move together. And so the accountability then becomes clearer as well as the transparency of what you value and what your vow is uh, to make a difference. So that I think is, you know, a very important way to, to proceed. And then uh, just in, in closing in my last uh, slide, um, and some of us were able to uh, experience the incredible poetry of Amanda Gorman at the inauguration of uh, President Biden. And this line, I think that she said to me is just crucial to understanding our sense of responsibility. And she says, the new dawn blooms as we free it for there's always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. So I encourage all of you, including myself, to be brave enough to be it, so that we continue to make this change, so that we're building a cultural legacy that our successors will be proud to step into and to move forward as we continue to do this wonderful work that we love. So I thank you so much for your kind attention. And now I believe we're open for questions and answers. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you for such an inspiring presentation. It really has opened my eyes to a lot of things that I had never thought about. about. Uh, but one thing I was hoping is that you could give us uh, an address or a link for that Harvard test, because I had not heard of it before, and I would really like to be able to access it. I'm sorry. Uh, to, to, to do what? I couldn't hear. <clears throat> OK. Put the camera this way. Oh, this way. OK, sorry. <laughs> Do you need me to repeat it all? No. Uh, so this was really amazing and very inspiring. And I've learned a lot that I wasn't even aware of. Uh, but one thing that I would really like is if you could give us an address for that Harvard uh, test, because I would really like to incorporate that into an, our organization. To, I'm sorry, to address the <laughs> The Harvard link for oh, that. Oh, the Harvard Implicit Bias Test. Yes. Um, it's online. It's, it's, it's online, frankly. If you just Google Harvard Implicit Bias Test, the link pops right up. And then it has a whole schedule of different tests that you can take. But it's free. That's amazing. That's yes, please take that as soon as you can and encourage everyone. You know, what you may do is make it a group exercise for your team or where you work, everyone take it and then discuss the results. Or you may want to keep it personal. That's fine. Thank That's you. Fine. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. I agree. It was an amazing presentation. And my question, and I'm sure the, the Cultural Council is always so good at doing this, are we going to get all these slides in our yes. inbox? Yes. <laughs> That's fantastic. Because I meant really... to say that. Yes, absolutely. Right. The information belongs to the universe. Hey, Donna, it's Dave Lawrence. Oh, yes. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was fantastic always love hearing you speak so I was really um, 
uh, I loved the statement about controlling uh, the process, not the content of race talk. Can you give maybe some examples of how we might do that and create those safe spaces for those conversations both in the boardroom and in our staff meetings? Because um, I thought that was really interesting that, that because I think so often we, we as leaders are trying to control the talk that happens, but it's really the process. So are there ways that we can do that to, to help engender those conversations? Yes, that's a great question. Thank you. I, I think it, it needs an objective voice, quite frankly. I think it's, it, it's challenging when it comes from leadership and then asking those questions. Um, I think that some people are intimidated. You know, we have that hierarchy within the uh, structure of the organization. And again, it's about having that safe space that I can say that, you know, the fact that you looked at me and didn't address me or that you ignored me, you know, that was very hurtful. An admin person who might be very intimidated to say that to the president of the organization. And so creating these opportunities to have these dialogues on a much more intimate uh, groups, I think is very important. And so one could be, one way it could be is having a consultant uh, or an external facilitator to just host these discussions in small groups. Small group discussion, I think, is very valuable. I don't think that's something you want to talk about in a big all staff meeting, but that small groups, five, six, seven people, you know, to go through what the unconscious biases that you may have experienced here, you know, or how can we make the uh, conversations or decision making more inclusive what else would you need to feel more valued you know those are things that you can facilitate small groups with a person who doesn't have the same kind of skin in the game as everyone else is there in the room because particularly if it's someone from hr uh, because oftentimes the hr department is viewed as the president's mouthpiece and so whatever i say it's going to get right back you know, to the head of the organization, the ED. Um, and so to instill the sense of freedom and objectivity, then having an external person can really contribute to that. We did that at NJPAC. We had a consultant to come in and she facilitated all these dialogues. And she gave us the headlines, but she definitely didn't identify who said it or, you know, what was the circumstance. Just gave us the broad strokes. I think it's really important because in our workspaces, we been successful at creating a climate where people are afraid to speak their truth. And if you can't do that, then you're not bringing all of you to work. So how do we create the opportunity for people to bring 100% of themselves to work? That means that whatever I say will be heard, will be respected, and I will not be punished because of what I'm expressing. And so in order to, to make that happen, then leadership has to reflect on their behavior and realize we're not perfect and that there's some things that we have to do better. And so those are ways, I think, to start to build that, that consciousness and create that environment. Hey, Ms. Donna, it's Tracy Butler from the Kravis Center here in West Palm. It's so Hi. great to see you. And you I do. had a question um, regarding um, getting your opinion on uh, the affinity groups that are sometimes uh, devised in organizations or sometimes in conferences where you have affinity groups that share similar, um, it could be similar positions, it could be similar uh, ethnic groups, it could be similar um, you know, uh, size organization that you work with. What is your opinion about that in regards to affinity groups for organizations, for arts organizations, and do they have a value? Absolutely. When you say affinity groups, you mean ERGs, right? Employee yes. Resources? Yes. yes. I think they're incredibly valuable. Incredibly valuable. And do you see um, sometimes, sometimes with groups to have a diversity within them, in addition to those that are affinity that have like people in the group? Is it good to have both? It depends on the purpose of the group. Um, I have worked with clients uh, that have affinity groups and they'll have all white affinity groups and mm -hmm. they'll have uh, people of color, they'll have black, they'll have, you know, so it, it depends on what you feel you need. Um, at NJPAC, we have them by ethnicity 
and they're not exclusive. They're very open. We welcome anyone who wants to come and be an ally. For instance, our LGBTQ, mm -hmm. um, it's not all members of the LGBT community. They're people who are allied and they want to support. And that's great. For our women's group, it's very diverse. It's women from all different aspects. And so I think it's up to the group to define their parameters and how they want to speak. I will tell you that certainly in the African-American ERG, there's a lot of cultural nuances that may not be as freely shared if there's someone participating that's not from that culture. Because then you have to explain. And, exactly. you have to explain. and the whole point was, this is a safe space where we can be us. Yes. And we can say what we need to say. I think it's also... Um, removing the need uh, that a white person may have that I need to be in these spaces. I need to be there and be comfortable with the fact that there's some spaces you don't need to be in mm -hmm. and that it will still, it will be advancing, it will be positive, and it'll be great. Thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> You're welcome. <clears throat> I know I can't really see everyone's show of hands, but. I would love to know how many of you are doing the work now. That's great. So um, who's about to speak in the mic? Can I pull it down a little bit? You okay. saw the hands up. Was that like half yeah. the room? Okay. The majority of the, how many hands were up? That are doing the work. That are doing some DEI work. What do you see? About half. Great, that's great, thank you, thank you. Um, my name is Pranu Kumar, thank you so, so much for uh, well, your incredible presentation today and your work. Um, I own a social justice driven children's bookstore and learning center uh, here woo. in West Palm Beach, um, been open for seven weeks, um, and I just feel so connected to everything that you're saying, and so, um, my work is really uh, with children and families and creating authentic and empowering experiences mm -hmm. um, and just hearing that sense of belonging and valued. And so you were talking about affinity groups and I kept thinking about that in the context of adults, but would you suggest um, beyond educational programming for the bookstore that we also provide affinity groups for children as well, um, whether it's middle and high school, whether it's elementary, do you think that is also an opportunity um, for children to be authentically themselves and share their experiences? Yes, yes, and yes. And I must tell you, I love your t-shirt. Oh, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> because that, that is the critical problem, yeah. the quality of education in the United States. I won't say that. I yeah. won't say the quality. I will say the content of education uh, in America with regard to um, particularly African Americans, Native Americans, is absolutely abhorrent. It is absolutely, it's so, in, uh, yeah. it is something that I am uh, extremely, extremely distressed and concerned about. My daughter um, went to public school when she was in, in uh, elementary and high school, and I was, you know, going with her homework. And I say, What do you mean Christopher Columbus discovered America? What do you mean? How can they write this? this is, so I called the teacher. I said, How do you go to sleep at night? Teaching lies. This is your responsibility to teach the accuracy of America. You know, I just found something that people will hear and go, oh, oh. So it got to the point where the principals at her school, when they saw me coming, because I would go up to the school, they would run. They said, oh, here she comes. And they would, they were ducking and running because, you, you know, you have to challenge that. I refuse for my daughter to be taught incorrect history because it has everything to do with identity, mm -hmm. your sense of place in the world, your sense of mission and respect. And so I think we have to be warriors mm -hmm. for education and particularly childhood education. Mm -hmm. So I can't thank you enough for having that bookstore and the legacy that you're creating. And yes, I think that having the affinity groups would be brilliant okay. and let the kids lead it. Yes. You don't have to be there. Yeah. Let them lead it. We have to trust them. Okay. So whatever that process is, this is what they need, not what we think they need. Um, I also think the role of the bookstore, I don't know if you have any partnerships with any of the arts organizations, do you? Um, I'm building it right now. <laughs> okay, so if I may, I would like to suggest that you identify some of the 
arts organizations, hopefully some in the room, that you can begin to be a partner with. Meaning you're providing content, but also through community engagement, they're utilizing your bookstore, mm. you know, as an opportunity to learn more about different cultures, different groups, to present panel discussions, you could screen film, you can make books available, have book talks, but that you're a content provider mm. for social justice. As I happen to know that Certainly, many arts organizations are looking for ways to start it. That, that's usually where we get stuck. How do I start? Because I already have 5,000 things to do. I don't have enough time, and now you want me to do this. How do I start? So, hello, ring, ring. Hi, I have a social justice bookstore, and we have great content, and we can roll it out this way for this price. Nothing for free. I don't believe in free, but <laughs> for this price, because everything costs. Yeah. And so if you give it away, then you're giving away your life. No, everything costs. So, but this, you have a wonderful opportunity to build this out. Start small so that you can manage it and that it's successful. But I do believe you have something that is really quite brilliant and having this content that many arts organizations are looking for. So go for it. Thank you, thank you. Hi, uh, I just wanted to take maybe a little bit of a different tact as we're talking about uh, affinity groups and some folks who know me and have grown up with me know that I'm very blunt, I'm a local here. And uh, I actually find the challenge is we are a very segregated community. Uh -huh. And so as we're talking about affinity groups, we mm -hmm. kind of already have a lot of affinity groups, I think. And what I would suggest is, particularly in the arts world, is that I tend to be the only black person that a lot of white people know when I, when I walk into uh, a meeting, into yep. a session, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so, actually, I'd like for us to take a few minutes to talk about, for those folks who are part of the global minority, mm -hmm. what are- what Majority. Are, no, global, Majority. I'm actually saying global minority. I'm, I really want us to actually talk to white people who oh, okay. typically uh, know one black person, maybe yep. one Hispanic person, two or three gay uh, folks, and that's about it. Mm -hmm. What would be the, because we're probably preaching to the choir to a degree here, but what part of our big challenge is this unconscious bias mm -hmm. and simply not knowing a significant number of people who do not look like you. Yep. Mm -hmm. So that's really the challenge, I think, for us in this community. You know, we've got our black sororities and fraternities, we have our black museums, Spady, all this kind of stuff here. But typically, when I'm involved in arts, I'm the only black person in the room. Or maybe Ethel mm -hmm. Isaacs Williams <laughs> joins me, and that's about it. So what do we say, you know, all of us, to our white colleagues who have some discomfort being around people who may be different from them, who simply do not know people who, who do not look as they look? Right. What's that, what does that dialogue look like? So if it's a colleague, then you'll say, how are you today? I've been thinking. And I know that we are really involved in expanding our diversity initiatives. There's a responsibility that everyone has in this endeavor. I'm doing my work by trying to be as open as possible and educate when, when I can, but I need you to do something as well. And here's the checklist. So you give them a checklist. So what organizations of color are you a member of, a card-carrying paid member of? Do you have the NAACP or Urban League? Where do you shop? Where do you spend your money? Where do you go for cultural fulfillment? Not just to the places you're accustomed to, but when do you step outside of your community? If you have children, what do their friends look like? How do you facilitate them having a much broader, diverse pool of friends? You know, where do you, what are you reading? And what are you talking about when you read that? You know, what are you watching? And so it's like all of the aspects of their life, 
you give them a checklist on, okay, try this. I've got one, two, three. Great. Okay. We've been, let's discuss this. We're going to come back. Accountability is critical. And so it's not just you do this, but I need to know that you're doing this and you need to broadcast this. Okay. Then we'll come back and see what's next. You know, go into a space where you're the, the minority, a white person. Go into the space where you're one of the few people that's white that's there. See what that feels like. What stores do you support? Where do you buy your clothes, your food? Does everything have to be at Whole Foods? Where else can you go that's in the community where you're supporting locally? But without that directive, I believe there's a total ignorance of what those opportunities could look like. And so again, it's sharing this information, but also following up and accountability. So I need you to come back and tell me what have you accomplished? You know, and so this can become a group conversation. So it becomes something that the team does. It's kind of like, okay, we, this is what we're gonna do. The month of September, everyone choose at least one, two, and it has to be sustainable. This is not gesture efforts. This is sustainable over time. So this is, uh, where can you invest your life, your time to build? So I love that you brought up this point. This is, this is critical. You know, that, as you said, and I read something the other day about being the only black person in the room. It was written by uh, one of the artists. I can't remember who was a playwright. And she was saying, I used to get so angry at being the only black person. But now I welcome this as an opportunity to advance, to teach, to build. And so it's also how, because I've, that's been my whole career. Uh, and I have welcomed the opportunity to continue to grow, but it can be wearying. I understand. <laughs> I well, thank you so, so much. I hope that's helpful. It was very helpful. helpful. Thank you okay. so much. Great. Thank you for it. Uh, Don, I, I want to thank you for today. It has been a, a wonderful session. And I also want to thank you for your book, Invitation to the Party. I read oh. that many, many years ago. <clears throat> and it has guided my work um, for all these years. So thank you for that. And a big plug for that book for those of you who have not read it. Um, my question today is uh, about process. Um, I'm currently executive director of Miami City Ballet and Miami City Ballet in the Palm Beaches. And ah. we started a formal DEI initiative in January of this year. And I say formal mm -hmm. because we have been doing a lot of work leading up to that. Okay. Um, I thought that I could get different groups of the company into the steering committee and into the dialogue, having everybody in the room so we can break down the hierarchy. So mm -hmm. we had board members with Good. staff members, with executive director, with artistic director. And mm -hmm. what I found was that even though we have our agreements, which we read, we have 10 agreements that we read before every meeting, creating a safe space. What I found was that still the power and privilege in the room um, created the hierarchy that I was trying to break down. And mm -hmm. that there are people in the room who are still fearful of speaking up. The experiences are very different, experiences of board members versus staff members. And um, the conversations have not been as easy as I thought they would be. And so what recommendations do you have in order to break down those hierarchies? So I believe in allies. And so before you go into the room, before you have that dialogue, I would try to identify who can help you to unpack that in the room once everyone comes together. And so not just you facilitating and saying, okay, this is the goal, but you've already had your pre-interviews with some of the key board members, executive directors, to say, this is what I've observed. There's an imbalance in power here. I don't see the kind of freedom and space that we need in order to be successful. Let's talk about how we can unpack that. <coughs> so you're asking them to be your ally. So <clears throat> Part of it is their behavior, <clears throat> their demeanor. <clears throat> How do they present themselves? Are they looking very authoritative? Are they open? And they may not even be conscious of this because this is the hat they wear. So they're this, they're this way all the time. You know, I'm a board member, so you know, I, I can wield my power. I raise the money, you know, all of those things. So it's, it's making them aware of that, that it's off-putting 
and that it creates a very small space in order to be yourself. So how can we open that up? And so it's getting your allies who are willing to now look at this internally and be able to transform that. So they bring that into the space. They also can speak to their colleagues and say, listen, if we're gonna do this, this is what we need to make it successful. We have to think about what do we mean by power? And how do we wield that when we go into a room? How can we make this much more open based on our behavior, the way we look, how are we listening? You know, so that it's, it is, it's that tactical, it's that, that granular, you know, that you, you're involving the individuals to help you create this culture. Because culture is behavior. It's not a magic pill. It won't be you wake up and we got a memo. It's like, oh, got it. It's how we believe, how we behave, how we think. And so I think it's a process. So if I were you, I would do my one-on-ones, a little strategy conversation. And you can say, you know, the field, so that you don't make it personal. You can say, in the field, this is what's happening right now. And we have such a powerful and successful board. This is how we can be even stronger. Listen to these two, three points that I want to share with you, because I, what our vision is to have a much more inclusive environment. And you talk about the sense of belonging. And a person, it's hard to feel you belong in the room when you're afraid, well, I better not say too much, or I better just say one thing, or if I'm a woman, the men are going to overtalk me, you know, all of those things. So it's, it's a process of building this culture and putting it on a timeline, you with established goals, along with who do you think is an ally that, can, that will understand and help you in shaping this. And so I would give this three months, four months to really build it, to make it you know, granular uh, so people can understand what it is that you're talking about. Very subtle, that's the thing. This DEI, the diversity piece, we see it. Boom, who's in the room? Okay, we can see you got more women, you got more LGBTQ, you can see that. But that equity inclusion piece, very subtle, very subtle. And that's to me, you have to drill down, really do that work. So that would be my suggestion to begin um, in that way. Thank I'm you. I'm a board member. You're welcome. I'm a board member of way too many organizations that I try very hard not to carry that culture of, I'm a board member and I'm gonna tell you what to do. Something we have to be mindful of. Thank you. Time's up, sorry. Let's give Donna another round of applause.